good evening uh, everyone uh, co chairman indian school of urology dr arun chawla faculty for today's program dr uh, arvind panda and uh, dear presidents today we have having another important topic in female urology that is stress urinary incontinence it's a very common uh, problem and uh, this is another important topic uh, in the curriculum uh, today we are having uh, dr arin padda uh, who was a faculty earlier at cmc vellu now he is the uh, senior consultant urologist at the kims hyderabad and uh, he is uh, a very uh, eminent faculty in urology he will be deliberating to you uh, regarding stress and incontinence uh, the evaluation management and other case scenarios related and um, it's a good opportunity for you all to interact with uh, dr arvind uh, in this uh, usi smart resident uh, learning program with these few words i welcome all you all of you today to this uh, virtual class in urology on uh, stress urinary incontinence i would request uh, dr arun chawla co chairman indian school of urology to say a few words over to you arun uh, thank you sir i think um, the residents are lucky to have today one of a very renowned faculty in the area of functional urology who is here to deliver this uh, uh, talk on this subject and um, um, if they remember if you open the campbell uh, other than integral and um, uh, the amoxury you won't know beyond that i think um, uh, arvind has uh, prepared a very nice talk which will clear uh, and just summarize the whole sui in a Uh, 35 to 40 minutes of presentation which will be supplemented and augmented with a very nice case presentation i think you will have all the concept of sui cleared along with the evaluation and management uh, without much ado i'll just request dr gtp to invite him to start the proceedings uh, thank you arun for your enlightening words now i invite uh, dr arvind panda the faculties for today's program for uh, the deliberation over to you arvin sir i'll just like to start off right away uh, we don't have much time so uh, i like to share my screen uh, uh, i hope i'm audible to everybody yeah so we'll start off with a case you know you this is a very common scenario where you get a postmenopausal lady a 55 year old lady and may she may be overweight she may not be overweight and she has a mass descending and incontinence of urine uh, during sneezing and changing position now many causes of this but this is a very common scenario which you may get in the opd and uh, how well do you man how well do we manage this how what are the uh possible options for us is what i'm going to dis uh, uh, discuss now so firstly before we go ahead to go into the uh, details of management we have to understand the relevant anatomy and how it affects uh, stress in uh, stress in continence in, in women in this is particularly about women i am not discussing about post prostatectomy incontinence here so we have this uh, stress what is the definition definition is involuntary leakage on effort or exertion or on sneezing or coughing now there is something called aerodynamic terminology also so if you talk about aerodynamic terminology this is involuntary leakage of urine during increase of abdominal pressure in the absence of a genuine of a retrusor contraction so we are not confusing this with urge or mixed incontinence here so i can actually discuss that during the discussion part but here i am going to confine myself to gsi the old term of genuine stress incontinence so this we all know that perineum is a diamond shaped area and there's a diaphragm that separate the pelvic cavity from the perineum we know about the urethra also this is the surface anatomy and uh, with urethra is embedded in the intervaginal wall it is surrounded by rectal tissue in all structures except posteriorly that relates to the vaginal wall and it's about 4 cm 6 mm in diameter but can be dilated to 1 cm it extends from the neck of the bladder to the external urethral meatus and is oriented almost vertically in the standing patient 
and uh, it is in continuation. You know, there's a continence mechanism which we have to know. It is in continuation of the detrusor rings. There are two rings in the detrusor, and the surrounding endopelvic fascia, and there are certain muscles. Now, look, look at this. These are the rings of the detrusor. You can see them here. And uh, there's a trigonal link, and there are retrusor loops which open in opposite direction. And the proximal urethra is what passes between these two loops. Also, the urethra itself has a vascular spongy core, produces mucosal, mucus, and it has a mucosal scene mechanism. And the compression from the middle mucosal core is what gives the urethral, the, the urethral closure uh, pressure. And there's an outer seromuscular layer that augments the closure pressure. So what is important is the submucosal plexus and the epithelium of the urethra estrogen sensitive. So when it is in the menopause, if you, if you notice that most of these symptoms, if you, if, you, if you think about these symptoms, most of these symptoms of stress leak come to us in the, the patients come to us in the perimenopausal group or the menopausal group. Very rarely will you see a young patient. You do see, but it's rare. What is important is these components, all these components act as a unit and they contract voluntarily and they prevent incontinence. The last two will also compress the vagina. And the innovation is for the pudendal nerve. What happens is when there is childbirth, particularly vaginal delivery, uh, with sometimes without episiotomy, the damage can occur there. And one childbirth may not cause so much damage. But if you're going to look at two or three children, uh, maybe four children, then this becomes more and more common as the pelvic floor becomes more lax. So in endopelvic fossa, uh, so there is something called endopelvic fossa, which we all know. And uh, the, in the, in the nulliparous standing woman, the bladder, the proximal vagina, and the rectum lie in a horizontal axis. And uh, the urethra and the distal one third of the vagina and the anal canal are oriented almost vertically. This is maintained by the endopelvic fossa. The endopelvic fossa is not just one layer. It's something that encloses all the tissues and then extends to the side walls. So it's basically a three-dimensional meshwork of collagen. That's what I want to tell. It's just not one uh, one layer which is there. There's the pubocervical fascia and, and uh, this anterior vaginal fascia. And that is what provides a hammock or a sling for the urethra and the bladder. You can see I have marked it in red. And what happens is when there's increased abdominal pressure normally in a normal in a individual uh, female, uh, the it compresses that low urinary tract against the pubocervical fossa. So it actually increase in abdominal pressure will cause urethrovesicole junction trapping and therefore will promote, incontin uh, promote continence. This is in a normal individual. But what happens is when this anatomy is distorted, this urethrovesicle junction trapping can no longer occur. And that is where we have a problem. That is where we have episodes of uh, stress incontinence. So this we all know, I'll just skip it quickly. The liver turnine muscles, pubococcygeus, illococcygeus. And uh, this, okay, we have already gone through this. Now, when we talk about stress incontinence, there are two theories, which I think all of you know. One is the hammock theory, second is the intrinsic sphincter deficiency theory. And uh, the hammock, this is uh, has already described to you, the endopelvic fossa. The hammock of the endopelvic fossa acts as a backboard for the urethra to be compressed with increased abdominal pressure, which I just described. And uh, here, the, there is something called the arcus tendinous fossa pelvis. And it acts as, a, as beams in the pelvis with the endopelvic fossa and it serves as a hammock because hammock needs to side support, side support. And that is where the arcus tendinous fossa pelvis provides those side supports. So this is it. And uh, if you look at this, is, if you look at a dissection, cadaveric dissection, so this is the position of the mid urethra and mid urethral hammock. So this is the mid urethra, that is the bladder neck in the surface. And when you dissect it from inside, this is what you are going to see. This is the mid urethral hammock. And uh, okay, and then we'll go and urethral hypermobility is something I've heard of. That's when the ureth instead of the uh, bladder neck staying up, it, gets, it descends, particularly on Valsalva. And then there is integral theory of continence, you know, this is uh, that says that the pelvic organ prolapse is caused mainly by connective tissue laxity in the vagina or its supporting ligaments. So stress in incontinence essentially due to pelvic floor muscle weakness. This is what the integral theory of continence says. And then there is, of course, 
intrinsic spinter deficiency and there because there are certain now integral theory cannot explain all uh, uh, all the call cases of of incontinence because there are certain women who do not have hypermobility so for when you talk of integral theory there must be hypermobility uh, which you can which you can demonstrate on mcu on wall cellular maneuver if there is no hypermobility and still there is incontinence there must be some other reason why that particular uh, lady has incontinence and this could be due to a fixed incompetent sphincter due to whatever cause so this is called the intrinsic sphincter deficiency the two broad uh, reasons why someone can have incontinence so this is isd so you see there is no urethral hypermobility on this mcu what is happening is that for the the urethra is like a is like a pipe and the urine just leaks through open like a pipe open in a pipe like urethra so i'll just go through one case so we have a 38 year old female uh, there is incontinence in two years and particularly on coughing squatting and lifting weights there is no urge there's no urge leak there's no nocturnal leak this is very typical the first thing when a patient comes to you is what you need to see is you need to ask that patient take a proper history okay you leak but why do you leak what when do you leak and during what activity do you leak and then you need to ask do you have any episodes of urgency they don't really understand sometimes what urgency means and that's something i have to explain to them and typically these patients who have uh, pure stress leak do not have any nocturnal leak so there are no voiding symptoms and um, she has undergone anterior calporaphy posterior calporo perineography and there's no improvement in symptoms now this is something which you have to be very careful uh, these are surgeries which don't always help she has four children all normal vaginal delivery she underwent tubectomy say 14 years back abdominal examination is unremarkable perineal examination again no sister seal supine stress leak is absent now the, what is the supine stress test this is something you are going to hear very commonly what is the supine stress test and in supine how to perform it you put the position in every case of stress leak you have to demonstrate the stress leak unless you demonstrate the stress leak we really cannot say whether the patient is actually having a leak or it is something else so the patient has to be put in a lithotomy position uh you can fill up uh, sometimes you have 200 ml of saline you can fill up the bladder using gravity or you can sometimes you can say an ultrasound we can roughly see how much uh, urine is there in the bladder if you have an ultrasound regularly available and then i use cough and then the valsalva now the efflux of the bladder solution from the urethral meters must coincide with the cough or valsalva that is when it's a positive test if it doesn't coincide it's not this is what was originally described so now my question is what would you do next and uh, if such a patient comes to you i would do three things i would up if the how do you do metric first that's for me is very important because that gives me an indication of how competent the outlet is and then see the post for residual urine the blood diary and we, of course we are going to see urine microscopic culture these are something which are quite important which we need to do why because sometimes if you examine the patient's very fatty patient you may not be able to palpate the bladder you can have a stress type of leak even when there is an urethral narrowing and there's a high very high pvr it it, it presents the same way so when we in the so again first thing and then you have to give a bladder diary ideally if possible give a 48 hour bladder diary but if that's not possible at least a 24 hours bladder diary anything less than that is not acceptable uh, we have got enough studies to show that a 3 day bladder diary is more accurate than a 1 day bladder diary but then there are compliance issues and generally patients if you explain them well what to do in a bladder diary they will come up with a reasonable one sometimes of course you will have to tell send them back again so what was the intake in this patient 1300 1100 to 1324 hours output was about 1000 to 1500 in 24 hours she leaked four to five times each time 50 to 100 ml and frequency night zero day 56 this this is very typical flow now euroflow matter this is very typical flow they are generally have a super flow they have a flow which more than 40 more than sometimes goes up to 50 or 60 so when you have a flow like this 
it indicates that the outlet is relatively incompetent. It supports my initial diagnosis that this is probably stress incontinence. In this case, you can see the Qmax is about 45, voided volume 880, PVR is 90. So there's no PVR, insignificant PVR, high voided volume she could hold. It was not an urge or an urge leak. She didn't have any urge leak or any mixed leak. And the uh, void was a very high uh, flow rate. And what is the significance of sold signify a low outlet resistance? Again, what would you do next? Now, would you do a systematogram and pressure flow study? This is something which I'm bringing up now. In uncomplicated stress urin uh, urinary incontinence, you do not need a aerodynamic study. This is something I want to emphasize. You do not need a urodynamic study in uncomplicated um, uh, stress in incontinence, even if you are planning surgery. So there are certain indications which I want to bring during the evaluation pattern, and I will come to it uh, come to it as I uh, as I proceed. And certain cases, however, you must do a systematogram pressure flow studies before proceeding further. This particular patient had a surgery before. She had a culporaphy and a culpoperineuraphy before, which did not help her. So we are looking at a patient where already a surgery has been performed for stress leak and it did not work. So in this particular patient, a systematogram pressure flow study is indicated. I'm just bringing this because if I bring this up now, you'll be able to correlate. Uncomplicated stress urinary incontinence without prior surgery, you do not need to do this. So, so I'll just go through it. Yeah. So this is, this is the indications. One is a failed incontinence procedure where there has been a previous operative intervention. If you wish to characterize the incontinence, you demonstrate stress leak and rule out detrusive overactivity. You want to assess the severity and possibly, if possible, predict the outcome. These are these very specific indications of aerodynamics in a patient with stress leak. So in this particular patient, what we saw is if you just look at this, if you just look at this, what we are seeing is this is the PDET and the compliance is relatively good. And we have done it many times, we have asked her to cough and we have also performed the Valsalva maneuver during this. And in each time there has been a bit of leak. You can see each time she has performed Valsalva here. I hope you can appreciate this. Each time, uh, okay, I'll just use a pen here. Each time, each time you can see each time she has uh, performed a cough here, each time she has, and she has actually, you know, leaked a little bit. So uh, she has a normal compliance. There is no detrusive overactivity, stress leak demonstrated in Valsalva, and there was low detrusive pressure during warding phase. And you can see this detrusive pressures actually were not high. This is when she was allowed to void and filling pressures. And, and when she did void here, these pressures are not high. These are not high pressures. These are uh, relatively low pressures and she was able to void. So, so I will come to again, how female voiders is completely different topic when some of them are Valsalva voiders, some of, uh, some of them have retrosal contraction, but completely different topic. What we had here is a low retrosal pressure during voiding phase and it may be due to decrease blood outlet resistance. So I will again um, go, go through this. What are the indications for the dynamics in SEY? mixed incontinence, prior surgical intervention, failed incontinence procedure, failed incontinence procedure, and coexistent in neurological diseases. Now, uh, we have certain data about this. What we know is, again, I'll just like to go through something called the intravesicular, uh, sorry, the abdominal leak point pressure. This is the intravesicular pressure which urine leakage occurs with increased abdominal pressure in the absence of pressure contraction. Now, normally, it should occur at pressures of more than 90 centimeters of water. And we say it is low abdominal leak point pressure when it occurs at less than 60 centimeters of water. Okay, so the supine stress test, again, we have gone, we have, I have told you how it is, how to do it. If you have a negative supine stress test, it means you don't have intrinsic splinter deficiency. And uh, this is a very non-invasive method of, of assessing the intrinsic splinter because this is what you want to know. Your, your management will differ whether it is intrinsic deficiency or it is um, just stress leak. So again, ALPP, UPP, they don't have a great correlation and there's no standardization here. I just want to just skip these things. Um, 
actually, if you look at something, if you have a low ALPP, it is a product treatment failure. While it correlates with the supine stress test and correlates with severity of incontinence, it's a poor predictor of treatment failure. So you can just go ahead. It doesn't matter how high or how low ALPP is. So this is, you may do it and have to leave the indication. Now, I just want to see, once you have diagnosed conservative, there are a few other things you need to ask. You need to ask that patient how many pads she is using per day in the bladder diary. So if you go back to the bladder diary, I think in this patient, we had a bladder diary here. If you go back to the bladder diary, something you need to ask is, okay, you have leaked so many times, how many pads are you using? And are you very uh, distressed by, the, by your leak? That will determine what sort of uh, management you are going to start with the patient. If the, if the number of pads used is high and she says, I always used pad, I'm very distressed, has affected my social um, my social life, uh, then and it's caused depression. Obviously, we might go for a slightly aggressive treatment initially. But in but in general, in general, what I want to say is initially, when you get a patient not very severe or moderate to stress incontinence, you try for a conservative management first. If it does not work, we proceed to the next step, which is which may be surgery. Uh, now, this I think you already described this. So what we are, when you are talking of a conservative management, we are talking about lifestyle intervention and pelvic floor muscle training. So it should be the first line of treatment in any age group. And uh, the, those patients who are really not surgical candidates, they should be initially offered conservative management. Those who have childbearing age, who, who may not have completed their family, those with a significant comorbidity and high surgical risk, and uh, those who have mixed incontinence and where overactive bladder has not been first addressed. Because if you, there is, is a significant overactivity bladder here, you, you still may do a, a surgical procedure for stress incontinence, but there's always a chances of, of having uh, a failure later. So what are the treatment options? First is behavioral modification. This is important. When a patient comes to you, first thing that you need to tell is behavioral modification, fluid restriction, timed wording. Now, most of these patients who do leak, they leak after a particular point. That, so after the bladder fills up to a particular volume is the time from after which they are going to leak. So if you can, if we can do behavioral modification, like tell them, see, are you, how much water do you drink? Most of these patients drink a lot of water. They feel water is good for them. So they drink maybe um, five, four liters, three and a half, four, five liters. You don't need that much water. Tell them to restrict their fluids. Second thing that we need to tell them is timed wording. Uh, I mean, go every two and a half hours, three hours before the bladder is very full, go and pass your the, the second point is behavior is pelvic uh, floor muscle exercises. And if you have biofeedback, most of us do not have biofeedback. It can be used in conjunction. Basically biofeedback is, is going to tell you whether the pelvic floor muscle exercises that they are going, they are doing, are if are effectively exercising that particular muscle group which you want them to exercise. If there's electrical so stimulation, which may be superficial on the perineum or maybe intravaginal, we may use Kegel cones, and there are medications. Estrogen I recommend for everybody. Duloxetine um, they have their complications. It's not recommended to use for everybody. So when you talk of behavioral modification, uh, fluid reduction first, twenty five percent of fluid if days total is more than 1.5 liters. Timed wording, I've already told you, adaptive behavior and pelvic floor. The rationale for pelvic floor muscles is, now, before any physical exertion, the activation of pelvic floor is an automatic anatomic response. A toned pelvic floor, by a toned pelvic floor, I mean a pelvic floor that is resistant to stretching. It supports the bladder neck, limiting its downward movements it facilitates more effective automatic motor unit firing of the pelvic floor muscles. When there is cough, there's automatic firing of the muscles and they tend to coapt and reduce the amount of leak. So this is something which people, if anyone is going to the gym, they would know any skeletal muscle. And the pelvic floor is effectively a skeletal muscle, is a skeletal muscle. There are four principles. One should be specific exercise that muscle, then overload that muscle so the muscle develops strength, then you progress and maintain the muscle mass. The aim is to alter the muscle morphology by increasing the cross-sectional area, 
increase the number and frequency of motor neuron excitation, improve the tone and stiffness. So in all muscles, an increase in strength will occur well before visible hypertrophy. Hypertrophy will only begin after a minimum of eight weeks of regular and intense strength training. So the point what I want to emphasize here is eight weeks is the minimum time you have to give before you can declare that your pelvic floor muscle exercises have failed in this particular patient. That's very important. So you need to give them two months. If you're starting pelvic floor muscle exercises, you need to give them at least two months and two months of good compliance and, and, and regular training before you can say this is not working. So the point is, the when you talk of pelvic floor muscle exercises, you talk this is behavioral change. It, it involves changing behavior and teaching new skills. Some of the ladies are self-motivated, particularly the young ladies, they are self-motivated. They can do these well. It's the old people which require assistance and are not able to isolate that muscle. Now, to isolate that muscle, this is a tip. What I do is uh, I put my, my, my glove lubricated finger in the rectum and I tell them to contract over my glove finger. I find that majority of them, of those who are old ladies, more than 60 years, majority of them, more than 70% are not able to do it the first time. So you need to tell them that you have to contract only that pelvic floor. So you have to contract over that glove finger. After training them for a bit of, uh, for maybe 15, 20 minutes, they are able to do it. And this is very crucial that you have trained them well, you tell them which is the muscle that you need to isolate and, and uh, exercise. If you have biofeedback, it of course is a big advantage because they can actually see on the screen uh, when that muscle contracts. So what I'm saying is supervised pelvic floor muscle training for at least three months. This is the first line treatment. So how, how many times? Eight contractions performed three times per day. And uh, biofeedback is not routinely necessary, but helps if you have. And uh, electrical stimulation you can do to women who cannot actively contract pelvic floor muscles. Basically, this more than actually stimulating that muscle and hypertroph and making and getting it hypertrophied, it will just show them which muscle it is and it may promote adherence to therapy. And if it is beneficial, you need to continue. So again, I just emphasize this because this is the most important surgery is only performed in 20 to 20 percent or less of women. 80 percent of the women who come to a stress leak will benefit from PFT. First thing is find the right muscle. OK, I have to have, as, as I have said, you can put a finger or whatever, make them lie down and then do it. Second thing is perfect the technique. So third thing is maintain focus when you're doing it. You must only use that pelvic floor muscle. You, it's important not to flex the muscle of abdomen, thigh and buttocks, they can do that. And repeat at least three times a day. They can do more than that, but three times a day is the bare minimum. And you have need 10 repetitions for a day. Electrical stimulation of course can be done, that's fine. And electrical stimulation may be useful, but again, we don't have really, we don't have a lot of data on that. And uh, cones are another uh, option, Kegel cones, they can be used. Uh, but again, this has to be done. You need to have a physiotherapy department who is interested, somebody is interested in this and is willing to do that. And these cones have to be separately bought for every patient. It's not something that, you know, you can uh, reuse among patients. I mean, multiple patients. Uh, pessaries, we do not know. You may use, suppose as a prolapse, it is important to reduce the prolapse first and see if there is any occult stress incontinence. Many, patients, many people with, with prolapse, uh, pelvic floor, I mean, pelvic organ prolapse can have occult stress and incontinence. Even in these patients, first correct the prolapse before going to treat the incontinence. That's what I would tell you at, uh, at the level of the resident, this is important to say. Correction at the same time, um, I wouldn't really recommend. That's not something which you need to say in the exams. So duloxetine, this is for uh, basically pure stress leak. Um, well, we have some data here and uh, number needed to treat was eight and number needed to harm was seven. So if you look at that data here, if NNT is going to be eight and NN harm is seven, I think uh, duloxetine doesn't have much role in just pure stress leak. Mixed leak sometimes we can use, but pure stress leak. So again, estrogens may have benefit. Again, stress leak, you can give them because no harm but not real benefit.
no real benefit. That's what we that's what the data is. So this is the data about the about the conservative management. What we got is we have pelvic floor muscles better than no treatment, and uh, group PFMT were similar to individual and home PFMT was worse than supervised PFMT. So and uh, again, this is something which I just want to say. This is similar. This is very similar. Like urethral injection therapy, and it really doesn't work. It doesn't work. I don't want to tell you. So a trial of conservative management should be the first line therapy. PFMT with or without biofeedback is better than other forms of therapy. Pharmacological therapy, significant side effect, limited efficacy, electrical stimulation. You may do tibial nerve stimulation, but the evidence is weak. And bulking agents you may use uh, with the confined decision making, no great benefit. Now we come back to the surgical therapy. Now surgical therapy, you are looking at a risk versus benefit ratio here. And what we have is uh, course, surgical therapy is invasive. And you must understand this is essentially a benign condition. It's not going to kill the patient. So we are looking at the best long-term result and minimum complications. So if you look at that, uh, there are two broad categories. We have bladder neck suspension, where the anterior vagina uses a hammock to elevate the bladder neck. It may be a needle suspension, and needle suspension don't work so well. And it may be retropubic suspension, which may be done abdominal approach or maybe laparoscopic approach. Doesn't really matter which approach it is. We're talking of abdominal, laparoscopic, robotic. We are talking of access. The surgery is the same. And let us not that the difference because uh, and uh, that's a different topic. We'll come to it later. So any of these approaches may be abdominal or laparoscopically. And then we have retropubic suspension. We talk of retropubic suspension. I want to be specific. We have birth suspension, colpo suspension. And we have the Marshall Marchetti Kranz technique. A slight modification in both techniques. Both of them are retropubic suspensions where what is done is the bladder neck is isolated. The bladder neck is isolated and then sutures are taken on the intravaginal wall and then they are hitched up. So the bladder neck is lifted up. Just black some bladder neck or the proximal urethra is lifted up and that and that sort of suspends it and uh, aids in, in, in uh, continence. It's, it's not very difficult. So they enter the atropubic space and then take those sutures. Then, then there are slings. Now slings are placed. I already have already. You know, we spoke about the hammock theory. We discussed the hammock theory earlier of the, in the midurethra. These are midurethral sling or bladder neck slings. They may correct. They correct the hypermotility and increase the intra increase the sphincter closure pressure. This is how they work. The principle is based that stress incontinence resulted from deficiency, both extrinsic and intrinsic deficiency. So called integral theory. And initially, Almstrom was the first person who actually reported on slings and 84% cure rate, he said, and there is no warning difficulty and no de novo in detrusor instability. And so this is a normal erythra. This is an incompetent erythra because, because of, uh, of uh, uh, various factors. And when you put a sling, what happens is it supports and partially compresses the erythral lumen. And when that does that, it aids in incontinence. In so... When you talk of mid urethral sling, a mid urethral sling may be two types of sling. We have autologous. Now, why I'm coming to autologous first? Initially, synthetic slings almost revolutionized, revolutionized the, uh, the stress urinary incontinence surgery, but there has been a lot of, um, uh, a lot of bad press about, uh, about synthetic slings and erosion and long term complications. And uh, while they are, they are still being used in the West, but they're used with a lot of a uh, lot of interpretation, with a lot of consent, and uh, they can stay. And many people are now shifting out to autologous sling, basically anterorectal fascia sling. A, a strip is taken from the anterorectal fascia, and it is uh, used from the vagina uh, to hitch the vagina. Synthetic synthetic sling, basically tension free vaginal tape. You can use a retropubic approach, or a, and a tension free vaginal tape. This is a transoperator approach, a, TV, a TOT or a TVTO. So the tension-free vaginal tape, uh, again, described by Armstrong in 1996, it basically positions a polypropylene mesh underneath the urethra. This is a monofilament mesh. It's a macroporous mesh, which means the each pore size of that mesh is more than 75 microns. 
Why this is so? Because this should basically it is to allow the free passage of, of macrophages and allow the ingrowth of the fibroblasts. This is fibrosis. These are all tension free. Please note the name. They are tension free. They are not to be put under tension. What happens is uh, you should be able to put a Hegar dilator or something in between the urethra and this mesh. What happens is ingrowth of fibroblast and then there is fibrosis there and that's what supports the urethra. Also, if you do it this way, that is you are minimizing, minimizing the chance of erosion or infection. So this is the, this is the so-called uh, transvaginal tape, so super pubic approach. This is how it is put. The danger with this approach is always that we can go through the bladder. And uh, this is something we need to take care. There's a catheter inside when you're doing it and it is empty and you just try to move it to the other side when, when you're doing it. And uh, this is how it is. We have a catheter guide some people use. This is the mess. And then uh, you just push it up and you hitch the, uh, the urethra. The surgery itself is not very complicated, but you need to know how to do it. And you need to be sure uh, that you are not going through the bladder wall. So this is how it is. Uh, this is how one moves the urethra away to the other side and then goes up here. And uh, just in the in the retropubic space, this is the bone, and you just go uh, above that bone, and then uh, it is pulled up and then cut, and then it is closed. Then we have the transoperative tape uh, described by Dillerome. Uh, what he described initially is the outside in procedure. It was inserted the mesh tape in the through a small niche in the groin area. So what happens is this eliminates retropubic needle passage. When you're going through retropubic space, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Not only the bladder, but uh, other things. There can be other vascular injury also if we go sideways here. The transopter tape was supposed to be a simpler make, um, operation and uh, it eliminates retropubic needle passage and therefore makes it much safer. So if you look at this, this is the transoperator approach where the tape actually goes through the operator, operator fossa, the super aspect on both sides. So this is the anatomical landmark. The tape passes through the medial edge of the operator foramen, just below the insertion of the adductor longus tenor. So this is the so two centimeters here. This is two centimeters, two centimeters. We mark off the skin and we try to go in through that way. Uh, this is the outside-in procedure. This, these special needles are all are used. And uh, then we mark out this place and then we go in through that and come out. This is the way it is done. Uh, but uh, this is not this, uh, this talk is not about teaching the technique that we'll learn later. This is how it will go in and then feel that thing and come out and then uh, push the urethra away and then do it the other way and this is. So there's another variation of this technique. In 2003, it was described by Dean Laval called the, the transoperative tape, vaginal tape inside out technique or the TBTO. In this technique, again, we use this, but the inside out technique where the sling is inserted from the vaginal side along with the winged guide, which is bendable. And the advantage of this is, well, the danger of this first technique is that you are actually coming in there, you may easily injure the urethra here. So in this particular technique, the outside in technique, the chance of you need to put your finger there, dissect it, not too much, but you need to dissect to put your finger protecting the urethra. And uh, in when we do the other technique here, uh, the TVTO, the chance of aerosol injury is much less. So in this technique, you need always to take the catheter out, do a cystoscopy with a zero degree telescope to see whether uh, you are actually, you know, any part of the urethra has been has been injured. With this less chance inside our technique, again, took a wind guide and put it up here and then uh, put it the same way and then we cut it and fix it. The mini sling also been described. Now, what I want to tell you is the mini sling is not as effective. Mini sling has been described, but it is not as effective as the other slings. I think it's on the way out. It's a matter of time. And uh, there are, uh, and then I like to describe a little bit about complications, short term and long term. So, if you look at uh, the mini urethral sling, the TVT, what we find is. Uh, the cure rate is not very different. You know, the cure rate is not very different. 
uh, to even compare to culpa suspension and it's it's the same so in terms of cure rate whatever we are doing it's not very different and uh, uh, but there is always a doubt that the complications of this link procedures may be over under reported and uh, there's always a doubt again it's surgeons you know higher complication they don't answer questionnaires and their differences will exist of course between high and low volume surgeons and uh, and then comorbidities what we have found is comorbidities increase the incidence of complication diabetes and coronary artery disease is a twofold increase in the risk of major complications sepsis cardiac failure obesity you cannot feel the landmarks it's, it becomes much more technically difficult and the complication rate go up much more and previous radiation avoid my advice is avoid these sort of surgeries in previous radiation in those who have undergone pelvic cancer it doesn't work well and you have a lot of complications so again complications as we can describe in two ways intraoperative immediate post operative hemorrhage and then the 2% uh, urethral bladder urethral injury and um, ureteral injury gastrointestinal injuries all these can occur rectal injury bladder injury is rare but can occur immediate post operative you can have cellulitis bleeding ileus then match erosion infection fistulas leg pain all these can actually occur one important thing i want to talk about is voiding dysfunction and uh, this occurs particularly if we have not evaluated the patient well or the or the sling is too tight and uh, the results are quite uh, you know quite good but the difference in complications you know the different surgeons you have a striking difference in complications uh the rate of complications between the surgeons that is something if you look at it 127 procedures and here is the percentage of perforations for this one procedure suddenly you have a huge number is a very high complication rate is lesser number of procedures same thing here so it is primarily so so it is i think uh, some of the complications are dependent on the high on the volume that is done and some of the complications also depend on where it is done how well you have been trained this looks like a simple operation but it can have a high degree of complications and these are rare complications and if you look at patients deaths are extremely uncommon but it has occurred it's not that deaths do not occur we have had vascular injuries and there are bowel injuries and eight patients have died of tv replacement these are fda data and we all know and we have already told you major complication be under reported in literature and uh, now if you look at it there are vascular space when i go in the retropepic space there is the pelvic floor vein epigastric vessel operator vessel i like vessel these are all there and and when you do a tvt the distance is from 3.2 to 4.9 cm if you look at it, your fingers it's not too much you are putting the trocar very close to these vascular structures and uh, minor bleeding may occur that's fine but major bleeding you have a problem you have to open immediately and even in tot those things can occur so if you have venous bleeding small ones you can observe two finger or gauze compression technique for just after surgery perforation again as i have said more common the retropepic sling tvt lower intraabdominal sling but it can occur and if you have prior surgery then it's more it's more chance of occurring are more bladder injury again you need to see with a 70 degree cystoscope that is what was it has been described see the entire bladder after you do a tvt with a distance with a 70 degrees to even with a even with the tot if there is bladder injury nothing to worry about just remove the trocar and repass it and with each pass of trocar you need to repeat the cystoscopy if there is a bladder injury no need to worry just drain the bladder for four for two to four days maybe four days will be better and then remove the catheter urethral injury again i already said more common in tot mesh remove that mesh urethral injury you cannot take it out and you must terminate the procedure it's not like a tvt procedure where you can continue in a tod procedure you must terminate the procedure and attempt only after the urethra is completely no question of going ahead and putting a sling if the urethra is injured in a tod not tod procedure this is how it all looks when the urethra is actually it perforates so always remove the mesh if you if Uh, if you find it an early explantation this is the scar is the removal and old meshes can be terrible to remove so prevention of inject normal saline behind the pubic bone hospital from the supra pubic insertion to the vaginal tunnel 
and uh, universal interpreter cystoscopy. Now, an operative vaginal wall perforation can occur. Again, you need to inspect the general wall well and you deposition the trocar and then suture the wall. Bollinger again is very rare, but uh, it can occur. Detection is crucial, repair is important. So again, new pelvic symptoms can occur after reconstructive pelvic surgery. This is something which we need to be careful about. And uh, on 42% of patients who underwent reconstructive pelvic surgery had new symptoms. So we need to take a good consent and we need to select our cases properly. And then we need to uh, go ahead with treatment. Just, uh, this is my last slide. I just want to tell you that most important thing is to be to make sure that you're selecting the patients right. Most of these patients can be managed very well conservatively. It's only a small, uh, small subgroup which requires surgery. And even in that, choose your case well and choose your procedure well. Uh, my preference is always to go for a autologous sling or a, a retropubic uh, surgical procedure. Uh, I prefer, I think that is far easier for, for, for us as urologists, easier to do. TBT or TOT can be done, but then it's if you have been trained well and you are sure that you can give a good result, please go ahead. So in con in conclusion, I like to say the concept has a mid sling as a surgical treatment. It's all comparable. Pregnancy is not absolute contraindication after a sling procedure. Uh, let's see, it's not an absolute indication. Thank you so much. Uh, so, I Arvind, think, you uh, have any case to discuss? Uh, so I had a case there, which I discussed in between. If they have any questions. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, have, uh, we have in the chat box, uh, I think, a few questions. Let me go to that. Um, so I had 45 minutes, so yeah, I think more or less okay. take to time. So the first question is, um, uh, should we differentiate SUI due to hypermobility and IST? If yes, how? This question is from Aditya Gupta. So it is it is worth uh, it is worth uh, differentiating. I've already said we can differentiate it uh, through. I have described those tests to differentiate. We can do aerodynamic tests also and differentiate. Uh, but whether that is going to uh, change your management, you might prefer to do a retropubic uh, sling procedure or a, for a uh, for a ISD uh, that has slightly better results than doing a mid urethral sling. Um, a UDS will easily, if you do an MCU and a UDS or do a video dynamic, you can easily differentiate that. That's not very different, not very difficult to do. Uh, but again, you may choose, you may choose a retropubic procedure uh, yeah. for a, I have for a uh, interresistment to deficiency. Yeah, Aditya, I think um, um, Dr. Arvind has made a very nice point. Um, this, uh, whether it's a youth of hypermobility or IST, uh, usually is. Uh, you don't have isolated condition of hypermobility, isolated IST. In majority of the patient, both the components are mixed in varying proportion. And the treatment more or less is the same, but what he has mentioned is if you have a patient with IST, uh, whether you have detected on um, clinical evaluation by using a cest or a UDS, the, the approach is towards uh, autologous facial sling or using the retropubic, which are a little more obstructive. And that's that's a universal, I think. That's a, uh, a very important point, and this is a, also the question which is asked by examiner also. If you have hypermobility, what will be your, your choice? If you have IST, uh, but as a student, you should know it's very difficult sometimes. But both the conditions usually they they play with each other in the majority of the women. And uh, um, Arvind, the next question is from again Aditya. Uh, if you are doing a bus uh, colpo suspension. Do you use absorbable or non-absorbable switches? Uh, I would personally prefer to use non-absorbable switches because I want those things to stay. Um, one of my preferences is used to, to use ethy bond. I don't use probably they can use ethy bond. Uh, that is a multi-filament suture and uh, that's quite soft. And uh, it's it is used uh, for the uh, um, uh, for the heart valve. That's how they fix those things. I would probably use that. 
I think not many people are doing birch call for suspension. Uh, do you agree with me that it is just oh, yes, very few people not as a competent not procedure less. when the yeah when the abdomen is opened. Yes. Even if uh, you are doing something in the abdominal, people will still like to go through a vaginal route or do some DOT or TBTO uh, if you have SUI. Uh, there are uh, very few indications left for a birch call for suspension. Um, but it was a gold standard for a long time. Um, uh, Arvind, there are only two doubts. Um, now, um, I'll just uh, uh, invite more questions from the resident. If they have, they can just unmute themselves or they can put in the chat box. Uh, but for residents, uh, if, you have, if you have attended this uh, webinar with concentration, I think this is more than enough for your... Uh, knowledge and curriculum. Uh, you, you, you need not go uh, too much into the further details and the nuances of uh, female urology in terms of SUI. I think he has covered very nicely the importance of clinical physical examination, clinical examination, the history, the, the importance of bladder diary and the urophlometry is is never never underestimated in these in this woman with SUI. And um, uh, he has uh, uh, very rightly mentioned that how you make use of UDS in differentiating the conditions. But in index patient, uncomplicated SUI, and a young patient, you need not do it. Uh, but you have to uh, choose the patient where you need to do the UDS before SUI. I think the treatment part, what if if you see the, the slides, the three or four, four slides for PFMT, pelvic floor muscle training were brilliant. I think you know, the, the, the uh, exam also, the note usually will come. If you don't, if, usually it's like SUI, the evaluation or the integral theory or the hammock theory, different theories, uh, Petros and Amshin theory. But sometimes the note comes on the specific arms of conservative management or specific procedure. And in this, PFMT is a very, very important uh, uh, condition where the note is usually asked to uh, a short note or, or, or some other form of uh, um, uh, question on the PFMT. And it was very nicely covered. Uh, regarding the operative management, he has uh, uh, almost covered all the um, uh, scenarios uh, uh, using the facial slings, uh, using the uh, mid uteral, whether taking the retropubic route or the optional route. Uh, but as a resident, what you have to understand is uh, you must be familiar about the retropubic route. This is very, very important for you. You should all, you should not be looking for just putting or seeing only the obturator meshes because, in a, in, as Dr. Arvind has mentioned, that he will choose uh, uh, the retropubic route or the auto autotrophy, which also involves a retropubic route. All the AFS involves a retropubic. The TVT involves retropubic. You, in, a, in a patient who fails for um, you know, this our primary issue surgery, you may you choose a retropubic route after definitely evaluating with UDS and all that. So this route is very important for you to understand. And to learn this uh, uh, retropubic anatomy, you should uh, recall your knowledge of uh, uh, the anatomy classes or you should go to the, uh, 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 if you have a museum and all that, go to the picture in the YouTube uh, because when you have to practice um, outside, you should be very clear. And other thing which Dr. Arvind was mentioning, that if you commit some uh, commit some uh, um, uterine injury and all that, mesh cannot be put at all. You can't put an artificial material when, when you have a uterine injury. So what, um, what, what can be put at that moment is only the, only the tissue sling. And the tissue sling has to go through the retropubic route. Then that's how the importance of retropubic anatomy becomes very important for you. Uh, in female in relation to SUI and uh, in male, it is related to the prostate cancer. So both the questions are usually asked in theory. And uh, I think before I hand over to Dr. Rajiv Sudh uh, to put his concluding remarks, uh, I'll say this was a brilliant so talk and very well. Just, I like just to share webinar. one one image. Uh, was... Pardon, Arvind? Well, just one image since he Pardon, asked. Arvind? I'll just share one image. This this image I want to share. Can you can you see okay. this image? Uh, yes, this yes, is yes. actually what you asked about. This is the birch call for suspension, 
and initially yeah. that question i understand that initially the initial birch kach alpha suspension used chromic switches but that is the initial part chromic catgut now everybody uses permanent switches there is no doubt in that and basically yeah. if you look at this uh, this procedure it is this is the this is the anterior vaginal wall and it is passed through full thickness just excluding the epithelium and then it is fixed to the above the cooper's ligament this is the cooper's ligament it is fixed above that so this is how i just wanted to show this because you asked that question so i'll just stop the sharing yeah. so please go ahead absolutely right and uh, and aditya um, uh, this is the conventionally there there are there have been now uh, uh, this our uh, with minimal surgery people started doing lap but which didn't pick up i think with the what arvind has robots i don't know whether he will start doing a, a robotic birch call for suspension in his center i don't know when whenever there is a indication while doing sacro colpopexy or some other procedure uh, so there is a there is a right in um, a robotic birch call for suspension also uh, but this is uh, the conventional where he has explained the use of non absorbable suture fixing the uh, paravaginal wall with the uh cooper's ligament the loose which is not midnight otherwise the tension you uh, but the, the whole webinar was well adapted and well tailored to your needs and i i think um, uh, um, this is uh, very important if, if you if you have uh, to revise it go back to the archives and read it because campbell is very difficult is very difficult to uh, read and prepare for the exam so this type of webinars if you have uh, in the form of slide out or handouts is very very easy to quickly summarize and revise quickly uh, over to you sir dr rajiv sud for concluding remarks thank you dr uh, arun chavla and uh, special thanks to dr arvind panda uh, this is a quite uh, interesting and uh, at the end the discussion was also made very interesting by dr uh, arun chavla basically stress uh, urinary in incontinence which is um, uh, dominated in uh, the condition dominated and managed in female is also a, a problem of male and especially after some uh, operations uh, which have been discussed but uh, yesterday we had very good topic that was psycho vaginal fistulas and uh, uh, ureter vaginal fistulas so these are the conditions where the female urology is in the forefront and uh, dr uh, uh, arun chavla has uh, both the days um, um, chipped in for important points and concluding for residents it is very important for the residents to understand which i keep on uh, uh, repeating that uh, our whole pattern of education is changing it has already been changed uh, with the fact from uh, 2019 for mbbs it is planned for uh, change in uh, post graduation and also in the post doctor courses like mch and dnb and uh, there are competency based uh, uh, curriculum which is being developed for all the stages and we are also developing through uh, our um, um, usi or indian school of urology it is very important to understand that and in this even in the internship the main diseases have been identified what are the common conditions and what is the standard uniformly acceptable way of dealing with these conditions in the management to uh, the um, treatment uh, uh, investigation diagnosis to treatment so this is uh, important and it has five stages one is the knowledge knowledge is imparted by such lectures and webinars and distant learning and this is our channel of indian school of urology which is uh, archived uh, constantly and uh, this uh, is the knowledge and uh, in the knowledge uh, like dr arvind panda has covered today it is uh, important that how uh, it is done so no no know how and after that are our uromat program that is show and show how and after that there is performance performance can be on the cadaveric or it can be in the wet labs or it can be actual uh, clinical conditions hands on uh, 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 situations also and workshops also so therefore 
today's lecture was in the first two levels of competency it was very important and it is going to be the pattern of uniform curriculum and you imparting education uniformly in the uniform way and you are uh, being exposed this is for the residents for the galaxy of uh, experts specialists who are skilled for one particular area and they are uh, sharing their views their educating pattern is uh, uh, i think you you are uh, getting imbibed into you, your day-to-day uh, -day practice. And uh, of course, stress urinary incontinence is inseparable when uh, from any practice, whether you are doing urology practice or you are doing the urogyne practice or even for the gynecologist when you are guiding them. And even in the after the perineal surgeries, after prostate surgery, after obstetrics, so many situations are there in the clinic also mm -hmm. where you are interacting with the patient with stress urinary incontinence. So it is uh, now the time to conclude and uh, everything has been said and we are ready for tomorrow's program, which is the crossfire uh, in endourology. And uh, that the, uh, the final A is going to be played tomorrow. And uh, I invite all of you to be part of that. Dr. Ganpule is, has organized very good program. And under uh, Indian School of Urology, the, the final will be instead of tomorrow, which was earlier advertised, it will be on 30th of December. And that will be the final of uh, resident debates also. And they, this will uh, be ultimately concluded with the rewards, awards, and uh, certificates, everything. And now we are entering in, in the next year, 2021, very soon after that. And I wish all of you the great festivity and um, the, the new year, which is forthcoming. And uh, stay tuned with uh, all the activities of uh, USI, Indian School of Urology. And uh, I'm uh, through this resident program, informing you our uh, program which was Euromet program which was halted we are reviving that and you are very soon going to get the notice for that and this is being revived on 30th and 31st of january watch for the notice and also um, come in large uh, numbers because it is going to be the physical one with all the precautions which are required in the pandemic so welcome you all to the new year and new programs of Indian School of Urology. Thank you very much, Dr. Arun Chavla, Dr. Mr. Navneet, technical team, and again, Dr. Arvind Panda, who has done excellent uh, presentation and interaction today uh, in this program. Thank you very much. Welcome Thank you. you. Navneet, just one minute. Navneet? Navneet? Yes, sir. Uh, the, there was a question from uh, the chat only. When this will be archived, this uh, lecture, webinar, they wanted to... Um, sir, uh, day, the... day after tomorrow, sir. Tomorrow oh, it will fine, be edited. Fine, fine. Day after fine. tomorrow it will be up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, thank, sir. You. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you. Sir. Yeah. Despite of COVID, we are able to archive 50 odd lectures and this is a great achievement of Indian School of Urology and uh, almost the, uh, the galaxy of uh, experts, they have imparted knowledge and this is all archived. You all visit that and uh, keep on uh, educating yourself through this distant learning. Thank you, good night. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir.